The Story of Civilization, Part 2, The Life of Greece, being a history of Greek civilization from the beginnings and of civilization in the Near East, from the death of Alexander to the Roman conquest, with an introduction on the prehistoric culture of Crete by Will Durrett, Chapter 13, The Morals and Manners of the Athenians, Section 8, Love and Marriage. Romantic love appears among the Greeks, but seldom as the cause of marriage. We find little of it in Homer, or Agamemnon, and Achilles. Frankly, think of Crassus and Brisais, even of the discouraging Cassandra, in terms of physical desire. Nausicaa, however, is a warning against too broad a generalization, and legends as old as Homer tell of Heracles and Iala of Orpheus and Eurydica, the lyric poets, again talk abundantly of love, commonly in the sense of amorous appetite. Stories like that which Stysichorus tells of a maiden dying for love are exceptional. But when the Anno, wife of Pythagoras, speaks of love as the sickness of a longing soul, we feel the authentic note of romantic rut. As refinement grows and superimposes poetry upon heat, the tender sentiment becomes more frequent, and the increasing delay that civilization places between desire and fulfillment gives imagination leisure to embellish the object of hope. Ascalus is still Homeric in his treatment of sex, but in Sophocles, we hear of love, who rules at will the gods, like in Antigone 781. If, when love disputes, he carries his battles. Love he loots, the rich of their chattels, by delicate cheeks on maiden's pillow. Watches he all the night time long, his prey he seeks over the billow. Pastoral haunts he prays among. Gods are deathless, and they cannot elude his whim. And oh, amid us whose life's a day, mad is the heart that broodeth him. And in Euripides, many a passage proclaims Eros's power, the latter dramatist often describe a youth desperately enamored of a girl and I presume they mean a young woman Aristotle suggests the real quality of romantic adoration when he remarks that lovers look at the eyes of the beloved in which modesty dwells such affairs in classic Greece lead rather to premarital relations than to matrimony. The Greeks consider romantic love to be a form of possession or madness, and would smile at anyone who should propose it as a fit guide in the choice of a marriage mate. Well, certainly the physical attraction from body to body, the social status and the wealth are legitimate enough of terms for marriage, but it's better to choose from character. Normally, marriage is arranged by the parents, as in always classic France, or by professional matchmakers, with an eye not to love, but to dowries. The father is expected to provide for his daughter a marriage portion of money, clothing, jewelry, and perhaps slaves. This remains, to its end, the property of the wife, and averts to her in case of a separation from her husband, a consideration that discourages divorce by the male, without a dowry, a girl has little chance of marriage. Therefore, where the father cannot give it to her, the relatives combine to provide it. Marriage by purchase, so frequently in Homeric days, has, by this means, been inverted in the Periclean Greece. In effect, as Euripides is Medea complains, the woman has to buy her master. The Greek then marries not for love, 
nor because he enjoys matrimony, for he prates endlessly about its tribulations, but to continue himself and the state through a wife suitably dowered. And children who will ward off the evil fate of an untended soul. You know, people want people to pray in their regard or whatever after they're dead. Or they want a legacy that will continue um, for them. Even with these inducements, he avoids wedlock as long as he can. The letter of the law forbids him to remain single. But the law is not always enforced in Periclean days, and after him the number of bachelors mounts, until it becomes one of the basic problems of Athens. There are so many ways of being amused in Greece. Those men who yield marry late, usually near thirty, and then insist upon brides not much older than fifteen. To mate a youth with a young wife is ill, says a character in Euripides. For a man's strength endures, while the bloom of beauty quickly leaves the woman's form. A choice having been made, and the dowry agreed upon, a solemn betrothal takes place in the home of the girl's father. There must be witnesses, but her own presence is not necessary. And Islam would disagree on that. You have to know that the woman consents. And you have to know secondhand, too, that somebody has testified it's on her behalf, these terms, and she really agrees to it. Without such a formal betrothal, no union is valid in Athenian law. It is considered to be the first act in the complex rite of marriage. The second act, which follows in a few days, is a feast in the house of the girl. Before coming to it, the bride and the bridegroom, in their separate homes, bade in ceremonial perfection. At the feast of the men of both families sit on one side of the room, the women on the other. A wedding cake is eaten and much wine is drunk, and then the bridegroom escorts his veiled and white-robed bride, whose face he may not yet have seen, into a carriage, and he takes her to his father's dwelling amid a procession of friends and flute-playing girls who light the way with torches and raise the hymenial chant. Hymenial is how we'd say it. Arrived, he carries the girl over the threshold as if in semblance of capture. The parents of the youth greet the girl and receive her with religious ceremony into the circle of the family and the worship of what it considers to be its gods. No priest, however, takes any part in the ritual. Islam also agrees with the fact you don't have to have a prescribed scholar or priest or whatever sanctioning the whole thing. The guests then escort the couple to their room with an epithalamion or marriage chamber song and linger boisterously at the door and the bridegroom announces to them that the marriage has been consummated. And nowadays we find that people tend to make it quick and then go back for you know, to make it count. Beside his wife, a man may take a concubine. We have courtesans for the sake of pleasure, says Demosthenes, concubines for the daily health of our bodies, and wives to bear us lawful offspring and to be the faithful guardians of our homes. Here, in one startling sentence, is the Greek view of woman in the classic age. Draco's laws permit concubinage, and after the Sicilian expedition of 415 BCE, when the role of citizens has been depleted by war and many girls cannot find husbands, the law explicitly allows double marriages. Socrates and Euripides are among those who assume this patriotic obligation. The wife usually accepts concubinage with oriental patience, knowing that the second wife, when her charms wear off, will become, in effect, a household slave, 
and that only the offspring of the first wife are counted legitimate. Now, Islam says that all the wives are legitimate, but, you know, this sort of thought is probably why the Christians at least put in the Bible that, you know, oh, the people at the top of the church aren't allowed to have multiple wives or start a polygamous marriage, right? But if you don't do justice to one wife, you know, what difference does that make if you're, well, I mean, it's, I guess, more why women that you're doing wrong to is, but you know what I mean. Adultery leads to divorce only when, committed by the wife, the husband in such case is spoken of as carrying horns, keroesis, and custom requires him to send his wife away. You make a gesture of the horns. That's where that comes from. It's an adulterous man. Or woman by the... The law makes adultery by woman or by a man with a married woman punishable with death. But the Greeks are too lenient to concupiscence to enforce this statute. The injured husband is usually left to deal with the adulterer as he will and can, sometimes killing him in flagranta delicto, sometimes sending a slave to beat him, sometimes contenting himself with a money indemnity. For the man, divorce is simple. He may dismiss his wife at any time without stating the cause. Barrenness is accepted as sufficient reason for divorcing a wife, since the purpose of marriage is to have children. If the man is sterile, Law permits, and public opinion recommends the reinforcement of the husband by a relative. The child born of such a union is considered to be the son of the husband and must rend, uh, uh, must tend his departed soul. The wife may not at will leave her husband, but she may ask the archons for a divorce on the ground of the cruelty or excesses of her mate. Islam allows divorce for either, but the woman can't just march off with her own property. She, she has to, you know, not her own property, but you mean the property that the husband gave her. Um, she has to prove by court that either she's been abandoned or whatever. And the husband's supposed to try towards the year's worth of maintenance that's left behind after his death and certain things for dowry. Divorce is allowed by mutual consent, usually expressed in a formal declaration to the archon in case of separation even where the husband has been guilty of adultery the children remain with the man all in all in the matter of sex relations Athenian custom and law are thoroughly man-made and represent an oriental retrogression from the society of Egypt Crete and the Homeric age <laughs>